Hello class and welcome to week four. This week we're going to talk mostly about how to build a good security program. Security programs consist of policies, standards, guidelines, procedures, and very importantly, training and awareness. All of these elements make up a security program and we many times see controls added as an element of the security program because without controls, we can't enforce policy, standards, guidelines, and check for whether procedures are being properly followed or whether the training and awareness is actually working properly. So the first thing we're going to talk about are policies. A policy is a statement of the organization's position. It is is not just, it's, it's management's expectations of what kinds of security outcomes they're looking for. And the policies are intended to influence behavior and information network security and application design. So it's everything we do in IT and everything we do on a day-to-day -day basis must be based on policies. And it goes beyond security policies. There are policies for almost everything that a business does. But in this class, we focus on the security policies. Policies specify outcomes expected by management. And these can be affected by regulations like SOX and HIPAA and the GLBA, stakeholder and customer expectations, you know, ethical considerations, what the customers and investors and employees, how do they expect the organization to manage the security of intellectual property, of personal information? So all of these things affect what management puts into policy statements. Policies specify what should happen, not how. So standards, guidelines, procedures, and the controls that we implement those all specify how, but a policy says, okay, this is what we want to accomplish. In other words, a policy might state, we must protect all restricted information with encryption when it passes across the internet. The standard might state that all, in, all information passing over the internet that is restricted must be encrypted with TLS. This tells us how it must be done. That is not put into the policy. All the policy states is it has to be encrypted. The standard says this is how the encryption must happen. Policies are developed by representatives from all affected groups. So you'll have represent security policies. You'll have a committee probably that, that includes all the directors or members from all of the IT teams. Uh, policies that directly impact business operation will have representatives from the affected business departments and teams because policies have to be not only achieving the outcomes management expects, but they have to be reasonable and appropriate. They cannot be too onerous and, and negatively affect business too much. Business still has to operate even while we protect information. And all policies are approved and supported by management. Every policy has, a, has an owner, and it's usually a manager. Usually it's a, the data owner, in many cases, is the policy owner and signs off on any policy when it's first created and any changes made to that policy. So what's in a policy? There can be many different components of a policy, but the basic content of a policy is what we just talked about. The first one is a statement of management's position. What does it expect the outcomes to be? Who owns the policy? And we talked about that a little bit too. It's usually the data owner. A lot of Sometimes it can be the security director. Sometimes it can be the IT manager. Who is responsible for ensuring compliance? Again, who is responsible for monitoring and ensuring that the policy is adhered to? This can be more than one person, just like the ownership of the policy can be more than one person. For ensuring compliance, it is almost always the security team's responsibility. They might also add the internal audit team, and it could also be 
individuals from the business team that is directly impacted by the policy. And all policies should include the sanctions or the penalties for not complying with the policy. This is a very important part. And these sanctions not only must be written into the policy, but they must be consistently applied for every instance in which the policy is violated. Now, when we create policies and we define the outcomes, we must measure to ensure that those outcomes are being met. So when we measure to create metrics for policies, we have to define what is to be measured and the expected results. And we follow the following criteria. We determine the effectiveness of the execution of the information security policy. We determine the effectiveness and efficiency of the delivery of information security services. And we assess the impact of an incident or other security event on the organization or its mission. So these things tell us what we should measure. What is it we want to measure in the metrics for a specific policy? What's the most important thing that we want to look at? And it can change from policy to policy. The methods for determining policy outcomes or vulnerability management, where we check for vulnerabilities that may be left even after we've applied standards and guidelines, log management to determine whether or not the systems and people that are accessing our services, our information services, are actually complying with policy following procedures. We do penetration tests, which is an extension of vulnerability management, which goes in and tests to see whether or not the standards, the guidelines, and the network design that we have come up with and implemented, whether it is actually achieving the outcomes the policies have, di have dictated. We can do response testing and root cause analysis. So we want to make sure we have an incident response team that is ready to respond in case an event happens to mitigate business impact. So even though we all of our policies, we might be getting the right outcomes, we know we can't be 100%. So we have to make sure that we have response teams ready to go and ready to react as quickly and effectively as possible to reduce business impact and audits. Audits are on top of everything else we do. They're done by people outside of the security team and usually people outside the IT department who come in and check to make sure that the outcomes management expects are actually being met. The audits, and we'll look at this in more detail later in the class, Audits do not look at in specific practices. What they look at instead is whether the policy outcomes are actually being met. If not, they file a report with the, with the IT department, with security, with management, and then steps are taken to determine why the outcomes are not being met and changes are made to standards, guidelines, procedures, and controls to adjust what's being done to achieve the outcomes. Policy levels of security. This is covered, this is something that's very important for the paper you're gonna be writing this week. There are three levels of security when we talk about policies, enterprise, system level, and issue. Now, this is a definition from windowsecurity.com, and it's one of the best ones I've found. A enterprise level policy, or otherwise known as a program level policy, its main function is to establish the security program, assign program management responsibilities, state the organization wide IT security goals and objectives, and provide a basis for enforcement. In other words, this is this is no this is a policy that that states that the organization that management is behind the protection of information resources, who's responsible for that. In other words, they'll they'll be setting this policy will set up data ownership as well as the security team and the security team's responsibilities. And it will determine how those policies are to be enforced or the sanctions applied. Most of the time, at least in my experience, 
organizations already have, the human resources department already has a process for applying sanctions to employees who don't follow policy. Security policies simply follow those same processes. So for example, the process could be that you're written up the first time, uh, the second time you're put on a performance improvement plan, and the third time you are terminated. Uh, if things are, are bad enough, sanction might result in immediate termination. But these things are all already defined by the Human Resources Department. They should apply across all policies, not just security policies. System level policies refer to the architecture and processes that ensure data and system security on in each individual computer system. Now, a computer system, that term can, applies in this class to all the devices and connectivity technology needed for a to support a business process. So, for example, a financial system or a payroll system includes the servers, the end user devices, the routers, the switches, the cabling, all of those things that go into creating the system to support the business process of payroll, for example. It facilitates the security of standalone and or network computer systems and servers from events and processes that can exploit or violate its security or stature. System level policies also include step-by-step -step configuration of systems. In many cases, this is part of what is necessary to support the policy. It says how the, how these, these, where these systems can be implemented. A lot of that is based on data classification. What kinds of data do these systems handle? So system level policies, to a great extent, are based on the classification of the data that is processed or stored on those systems. Issue-specific policies are about the types of subjects covered by, by current relevance, concern, and sometimes controversy upon which the organization needs to assert a position. Issue-specific policies are very common. Things like acceptable use policies that define how users can use company information resources, including phones and laptops, desktop systems, etc., one big one also is an email policy that defines how users are allowed to use email, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do with company email systems. These are all issue-specific policies. They serve to provide guidelines for the further development of procedures and practices within the functional elements of an organization. Now, once we have policies in place, we develop standards, guidelines, and procedures to support those policies. Standards are a collection of system-specific or procedural-specific requirements that must be met by everyone. Earlier in this lecture, we talked about the standard of using TLS to encrypt restricted data going out over the internet. That was a standard that supported a policy that stated that all restricted data must be encrypted as it passes over the internet. A guideline is a collection of system-specific or procedural-specific suggestions for best practice. Unlike standards, they are not requirements to be met, but they're strongly recommended. So standards and guidelines are designed to answer the question of how we are to meet the outcomes stated in policy. And procedures also support this. These procedures are step-by-step -step instructions for how to perform a business or IT task in order to consistently achieve policy compliance. Procedures might support standards and guidelines. You know, we might have standards and guidelines that state how a accounts payable clerk is supposed to protect information as they do their jobs during the day. Well, the manager of the accounts payable clerk will define procedures, step-by-step -step procedures for every task that the clerk performs to ensure that the clerk is always 
doing what is necessary to achieve policy compliance. This is why, in many cases, when we train users on policies, standards, guidelines, and procedures, we focus on the procedures. We may get tell them what the policy is so they understand why they have to do things in a certain way, but the procedures are the most important things they need to understand. They're documented and available for users to access, to double check, and make sure they're doing the right things. And managers must always be checking to make sure that the procedures are being followed. When an audit takes place, one of the first things we look at are whether the procedures are being followed and whether there's a hole in the procedures, a weakness in the procedures that allows outcomes to be missed. So that brings us to metrics and auditing. Metrics measures what we're trying to achieve. And in security, we're trying really to measure what we're trying to prevent. It's difficult in security to provide measurements of how effective security controls are because unless, some, unless an attack occurs and we can show the effectiveness of the controls, we really can't measure how well they're doing, which is why we do penetration tests. Compliance and certification is not necessarily security. So if we're compliant with SOX, we're compliant with HIPAA, we're compliant with standards of best practice like ISO 27002 or COVID-5, and we're, we're following internal standards and guidelines, it still doesn't mean that we're secure. We might have missed something. Uh, every organization is unique. So following, so following standards and guidelines and becoming compliant does not mean that the information is secure enough. The risk might still be too high. The best test is looking at the network from attacker's perspective and auditing overall outcomes. And this is why we do penetration tests. A penetration test is done by a certified certified ethical hacker who approaches an attack on a network just like an attacker would using the same tools and techniques. Now, a penetration test could be a white box, gray box, or black box. In a white box, the attacker knows all about the network. The penetration tester knows all about the network and is simply going through the motions to see what else can be found or whether the things that he knows about can be leveraged to affect an attack. In a gray box penetration test, the penetration tester knows some things about the network, but still has to find out other things. So she might go in and still have to do enumeration to identify additional devices on the network that could be used in the attack. In a black box test, which I always used for people coming in to test our networks, a black box test, the penetration tester knows nothing about the network. It's coming in just as an attacker would be doing, trying to gather information about the company and the network, identifying vulnerabilities, and trying to achieve the target. Audits measure outcomes to ensure compliance with policies. These are not risk assessments. Risk assessments are trying to determine risk. Audits are trying to determine compliance with policy. And there are two types of audits, internal and external. Internal audits are typically done by an internal audit team. A lot of smaller companies do not have internal auditors, so these, these things may not happen. And a lot of smaller companies can't afford external audits. So in many cases, audits are never performed by third parties for financial reasons. However, every organization should have someone come in once a year to take a look and make sure that the right security policies are in place, that the right controls are in place to support those policies, and including the right standards, guidelines, and procedures. This is very important. Um, for a very small company of 200, 250 employees, 
This might only take a couple days and it may not cost that much. But the breaches that can occur, the problems that can occur, cost far more than not doing this annual audit of the security program in the organization. So again, the purpose of the audit, it's based on policies and it is checking for outcomes. It does not check specifics. It's checking to see. So for example, a, an audit may check to see if all employees are being terminated upon or their accounts are being terminated when they leave the organization. For example, the audit team may take a sampling of the terminated employees from the human resources system and go into Active Directory and determine if those employees have had their accounts disabled. If they have not, then that means that something is going wrong. If one is missed, that's not a big deal. That happens, although the security team should have processes in place to go back and double check. If a large percentage have not been disabled, this is a material finding, which means the procedures are broken and need to be looked at to determine why the outcome of the policy, of the termination policies, are not being met. Audits are reported, the material findings of the audits, whether good or bad, are reported to senior management so that they can understand whether or not the outcomes they expect are actually being met. Next, we're going to cover employee, training and awareness. Employees are the largest attack surface in our organization. If they're not properly trained, they're, they're very vulnerable to social engineering, including phishing, spear phishing, and masquerading. And if they don't properly handle hard copy documents, they fuel dumpster diving. Other things that can cause employee vulnerability is carelessness, ignorance of policies, and revenge or social activism. All of these things have to be kept in mind when we're dealing with employees. Now, we can handle phishing, spear phishing, masquerading, dumpster diving. Social engineering and dumpster diving are handled by training. We can train our employees what to look for, what not to fall for. We can, we can implement procedures for how to handle phone calls or emails that might look legitimate, but still need to go through a process before they are uh, dealt with. Procedures can help with carelessness. Providing sanctions when users are careless can help them remember next time to make sure that they follow procedures. Ignorance of policies, that is definitely a problem if training is not occurring. Users don't know what outcomes they're supposed to be achieving or why they're following specific procedures. And human nature is such that if a person is not aware of why they're following a policy or why they're performing a procedure, uh, rather, then sometimes they might get a little lax. If they know that they're following procedure, a procedure to achieve a specific security outcome, they're more, they're more likely not to take shortcuts. So when we conduct training, we want to tell the employees the purpose of security and why it's important and how it affects each employee personally. So security, when we, when we train about security in an organization, we shouldn't just focus on the organization. We should also be focusing on how what they're learning affects them in their everyday life. So passwords. If I create strong passwords for the office, this is the outcomes I will get at the office, but I'll also get those same outcomes if I use strong passwords at home. In other words, show them how what they're learning in the classes affects what they do in their day-to-day -day lives. We want to let the employees know their importance in the, in the security management. And we want to train them on policy standards and guidelines. But remember, we also talked about making sure they understand the step-by-step -step procedures that support these and 
how they're related to enforcing policies, why they have to 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 actually why they have to comply with procedures and not take shortcuts. We support training with awareness. Awareness is a continuous campaign, whereas training may occur upon employment and once a year. Awareness goes on all the time. It could be with newsletters, daily, e daily or weekly emails, posters. It's just a way to keep security foremost in employees' minds. And training has three different audiences, employees, managers, and IT. Employees get basic security training. They're trained on the policies and standards that apply to them and the procedures that apply to what they do every day. Managers get that training, that training that the employees get, but they also retreat, receive training on how to create procedures that comply with standards and guidelines and how to ensure that the outcomes expected from those procedures are being met, how to measure success. And IT has the same training as employees, and the IT managers get the same training as all other business managers, but IT also has to be trained on the technical aspects of security, what is allowed, what is not allowed, how security design is is built into networks and systems, etc. The next thing that we're going to talk about is hardening a system. So we have all of these things. We have standards, guidelines, we have policies, we have procedures. One of the things that, that these elements of a security program should address is hardening all systems before they're put into production. So these are the hardening steps. We shut down all services and ports not needed for business operation. We remove all programs not needed for business operation. A lot of systems come with programs that we just don't need. End user devices are special, especially bad about this. You buy a, a, a laptop or a desktop and it comes with all kinds of software. Most of that stuff should just go away. On a server, a Windows server, you can actually set up role servers that only prefer, perform a specific role and have no other functionality installed on it. We want to place the system on a restricted virtual local area network. That virtual local area network is protected by access control lists, so only certain traffic is allowed in there. This helps to eliminate a lot of the threats that might hit that system. We need to run updated anti-malware software and run a host-based firewall and host-based IDS IPS on the server or workstation. Now, most of the business class solutions for anti-malware come with firewalls and come with IDS or IPS. It's just a matter of making sure that they're configured up and running and configured properly. One of the most important parts of hardening a system and keeping it hardened is keeping the system patched. By patching a system, we continuously work at eliminating, eliminating vulnerabilities that are leveraged by attackers. And finally, we want to remove local admin access for standard user access. There's no reason why our standard users need local admin access. And even IT users or, I, or admin users who are out browsing the internet should not have local admin access or ad, any admin access assigned to the account they use for that browsing. If we To test for hardness of a system or how secure a system is, we can use different tools. On this screen, which I'm going to leave up here for a couple minutes, are various tools that are free and can be used to test whether or not the steps that you've been taking to harden your systems are working. And these should be applied. Things like the Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer, 
and the Vault Nessus Vulnerability Scanner should be run against a system, any new system, before it moves from the testing environment to the production environment. So I'm going to leave this up for a couple minutes, copy these uh, links, and go take a look at these tools. So that's it for this week. Be sure to read all assigned reading. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask in the classroom. Have a great week.